So hello. Um, I'm happy to uh, welcome you to the second uh, panel of our discussion on nationalism, neoliberalism, and left perspectives. Uh, we will continue now with a panel um, about neoliberalism and nationalism. This is at least uh, what is uh, written in the program. Uh, but essentially, we are uh, continuing uh, uh, discussions we already started in the, in the first panel. So it will be also um, a multi-dimensional approach. Um, uh, we have presentations from different angles. I'm happy to, um, to welcome uh, our guests, uh, Maya Presnik. She's uh, uh, um, from Ljubljana, from the Peace Institute. Um, she will talk, um, she will continue fundamentally um, on the issue uh, uh, of the constellation inside Europe, uh, the, uh, uh, the relation between core and periphery uh, and the implications uh, on our topic of nationalism. Uh, uh, then uh, Nikola Vukupradovic from uh, Zagreb, he's an uh, activist in anti-fascist groups and member of the collective uh, of Le Monde Diplomatique, the Croatian edition. Uh, Nikola will um, continue um, the analysis about the specific um, uh, problems of uh, nationalism and transition uh, in the Yugoslav space in the 80s, 90s, until today. And our third guest is uh, Friedrich uh, Fritz Burschel from uh, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation from Berlin. Uh, Fritz is uh, working in the uh, headquarters of Rosa Luxemburg Foundation on the topic of uh, right-wing extremism and neo-fascism, mainly uh, in Germany, but also on European level. And uh, Fritz um, uh, will give us some insights uh, in the, uh, into the situation, uh, current situation in Germany. So nationalism in a core uh, country, it was mentioned um, uh, right now in the discussion that this problem uh, is a real one and a, a growing one. Um, Fritz uh, is also an observer of the trail against the neo-Nazi terrorist group NSU, National Socialist Underground, uh, which started a few days uh, ago in München, and he will link this topic of uh, racism, neo-fascist terror, uh, with the economics uh, position of Germany uh, in the frame of uh, Europe. So. We will start uh, with Maya. The floor, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I apologize. I was thrown into the water a few days ago. I didn't know that I participate in this panel too. Uh, but uh, having this occasion, I would like to share with you the concern of Slovenian people, concern uh, which lasted for two years and culminated in the uprisings, uh, last uprising since December last, last year. And I will also, I'm not an economist by my profession, but uh, we found out that we cannot leave economic issues anymore to the experts. So you will see also my few uh, examination investigations into, uh, amateur investigations into this direction, trying to explain what is happening to us. Uh, for the beginning, I propose to look at uh, the inter, uh, interrelation between neoliberalism and nationalism from the perspective of the EU composition. EU consists of national economies that have neither economic nor political independence. The effect of such structure is that member states compete with, with each other in domains still under their sovereignty by downgrading the standards of welfare state, rule of law, social and workers' rights, while at the same time they have to relieve the capital owners from the economic risk by socialization of private debt. Within this context, nationalist ideologies serve as instruments to impose discipline upon people, submit them to forms, new, new and new forms of exploitation, and limit their access to democratic decision-making processes. A type of government 
which can deal with this situation is the authoritarian type taking upon itself the offensive class struggle in the interest of capital owners. In this economic, socio-economic context, for the left is uh, really uh, little room. Economic crisis create, creates new interstate relations within Europe by offensive class struggle exercised by capitalist class upon working class. I, I will now switch to the example of uh, Slovenia and try to analyze my, this, this will be my amateur-like analysis of the situation. Compared to, an, to other European countries, can you switch the slide? The first slide? Compared to other European countries, Slovenia has a low ratio of government debt to GDP, as you see on the graph behind, and a considerably small financial sector. In general, the government indebtedness of post-socialist countries is below the EU average. However, Slovenia is according to anxious financial markets next in the line for a bailout after Cyprus. When, when Slovenia joined the EU in 2004, it had surplus in net international investment position. Can you next slide, please? After liber liberalization of capital, its net international position preponder preponderated from surplus to deficit. So before the Slovenia entered the un Union, its net international position was uh, uh, surplus. Now, uh, uh, what, 10 years after, uh, eight years after its uh, integration, uh, it is deficit. Uh, we ask why. In the period 2004-2008, 2008, banks and enterprises had easy access to European credits with low interest rates. Some credits, due to loosening control over banks and financial systems, were less pre precociously delivered to clients, for instance, business, businesses in the ownership of the Slovenian Catholic Church left behind the greatest debt of almost 1 billion euros. But some of these credits were used for investments in order to catch up European rivals and enterprises. These companies have now difficulties to repay them because of recession. The indebtedness of usual suspects, the state and the households, remained low or almost negligible in the same period. The thesis about the immoderate consumption of the state and households as generators of economic crisis is therefore, therefore totally false. Government indebtedness was kept, low, was kept low, as we saw before, up to 2008 until the outbreak of economic crisis. In crisis, Slovenian government had to assume responsibility for at least minimal, minimal social security for workers, victims of massive layoffs. layoffs. For instance, textile uh, factory Mura, a large part of construction sec sector. And more spending for social benefits due to growing unemployment. Simultaneous increasing of the, of the public spending and decreasing of economic growth, one of the biggest in the EU, caused public deficit. After 2000 and, uh, 2008, this process reached a state of snowball of debt. Moreover, socialization of bank credits and public investments by which the state tried to elevate the credit crunch have driven the state into the vicious circle of debt. Recently, Slovenia has found itself in the grip of financial markets which progressively intensify pressures, pressures upon the state by increasing the interest rate on new borrowing. Can you uh, switch to the other side? You can see here uh, the, the growth of interest rates in the last year. In two, in the, in the last year. Financial markets offer a simple alternative. Immediate socialization of bank credits, therefore, the risk should not be returned back to private money, money lenders, banks, 
and adapters, neither the debt can be even partially written off. F uh, and financial markets demand further reduction of public spending and new austerity measures, as well as privatization of financially, financially consolidated banks and companies in the state ownership. Or the alternative is a bailout under the same or even worse terms of Troika. As we already know, this policy will lead to economic recession, which could worsen the government debt to GDP ratio, but the interests of private money lenders will be protected. Moreover, Slovenia will have to, on one hand, give up its gradual privatization economic policy and its system of social protection, and on the other, sell out a great part of its economy most probably to foreign investors. investors. In the long term, this will mean that Slovenia will become a net exporter of capital. It will become a colonial uh, state. And when economic recovery come, will be people repaid for their sacrifices? Can you switch to the next slide, the last slide? Thank you. Owners of capital have already more agreeable pr provisions in Slovenia in comparison to the EU, EU average. As you see on the graph, state revenues from capital are therefore not likely to importantly increase with the eventual economic recovery. The graph presents the implicit tax rates for capital, labor, and consumption in Slovenia. We see that implicit tax rate for capital in Slovenia is more than five points lower than in EU uh, average. Implicit tax rate for labor is a little below uh, EU average. As we see, the costs of welfare state are already gravely levied upon consumers. It is not feasible that current deprivation of welfare state will be restored in the future. And frankly speaking, welfare state and social equality have no prospects in the present macroeconomic policy, neither in the core nor peripheral EU member states. I will now come back to the question of the uh, nationalism and go back to the early 90s. State building after the demise of socialist regimes in East Europe and Yugoslavia relied upon nationalist ideologies. If we look at citizenship policies at that time, we see that most of the countries opted for jus sanguinis instead of jus solis. Exceptions are only Russian Federation and uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina who opted for this more progressive uh, use solis citizenship uh, regulation. Uh, this state building and citizenship policies facilitated the transformation of the state from the people's state into an institution which manages human resources in order to increase world compet competitiveness, competition. Civil, political, and social rights of people have secondary importance uh, in such transformation of the state. This created a perfect playground for capital owners, here we mean multinationals, financial markets, and so on, who can, in cooperation, voluntary or enforced cooperation of the state, impose systematic if I can use this term, accumulation by dispossession. Uh, the, the one positive point of this story is, uh, uh, is this the, the end of nationalist myths. The myth of Slovenian independence is certainly gone, but left a great disillusion uh, with people. And what is the next step? Neocolonial relations within Europe bring new and even more serious tensions on nationalist basis uh, between South and North, between Germany and Greece, between uh, 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 Germany and Slovenia, uh, for instance, which can become explosive in the near future. And I will stop here and leave my um, co-speakers
to to explain what this new new fit near new feature can bring to us. Uh, thank you, Maya. Uh, Nicola, it's your turn. Uh, thank you. So. Um, I would like to give a brief contribution to the issue of nationalism in the European periphery uh, by the example of former Yugoslavia. So the goal is not just to give some kind of a historical account uh, of the events, but uh, also in a way to present um, some ideas on how should the left handle uh, national issues in the, in the periphery. So um, for the most part of the history of socialist Yugoslavia, there was an uh, open uh, fear inside the political leadership of the Federation that uh, the Federation, together with its uh, somehow specific market socialist project, could fall apart or would fall apart due to ethnic conflict between the nations of the former Yugoslavia. So the fear was strengthened uh, to a point by, by the experience of the inter-ethnic uh, slaughter during the World War II and the quite rapid disintegration of the, of the first Yugoslavia in the, in the 40s. So for this reason, as, as we all know, but maybe for, the, for our foreign guests, that uh, brotherhood and unity, uh, the popular slogan says, said, was supposed to be um, protected as an apple of the eye in order to prevent such, such a, a slaughter. So when the Federation, in fact, did disintegrate in, in an inter-ethnic uh, conflict in the early 90s, uh, this was and still is sometimes uh, uh, interpreted as some kind of fulfillment of the old prophecy of, or curse of uh, so-called uh, Balkan tribes or you know, the powder keg of Europe, etc. Uh, so these sometimes more and sometimes less overtly romantic interpretations of, of events all include the notion of some uh, specific specter of nationalism haunting the, the Balkans. Now, of course, very generally we can uh, say that this interpret interpretation is false and that there is nothing really specific about uh, Balkan nationalism or ethnic war in the Balkans. There is, in fact, no nation state in history that, had, that did not form through ethnic cleansing and force assimilation, etc. The, maybe the difference is in that this happened much earlier in the countries of which we now consider the core than on, than on the periphery. But uh, also, much more specifically, to say that the war of the 90s are a consequence of some mystic mentality uh, means deliberately overlooking the very material interest that led to this conflict. So, as we shall see, this, this type of obscurantism also plays a very concrete political role. Well, rather than awakening of some old spirits, the Yugoslav inter-republic conflict did have its economic causes. Uh, as the Yugoslav economic system was becoming more and more uh, market-oriented through vari various reforms, it developed some of the typical problems uh, uh, of this kind of economies such as high unemployment, which was, for instance, dealt with by exporting labor. But uh, even more importantly for this topic, uh, the reforms, these, these reforms contributed to, to unequal development between different regions inside Yugoslavia. Uh, of course, it can be said that uh, uh, regions of, very generally speaking, regions of north of Yugoslavia have always been uh, more developed than, than those in the south, south region. Uh, however, uh, it would seem that this underdevelopment clearly started to show uh, typical signs of dependency of the underdeveloped regions. Uh, some of these uh, signs can be, for instance, large part of the population surviving with subsistence uh, economic activities, uh, import of goods and export of raw material, and import of capital and export of labor to, to other republics. So we can say that regions such as Kosovo have uh, become essentially a periphery of the more developed northern regions of Yugoslavia. And uh, also very important, there was also a flip side to this dependency development, parallel to, to immigration primarily of Albanians and Bosnians, for instance, to Slovenia, northern Croatia, or northern Serbia. There was a strong anti-Albanian, anti-Bosnian uh, racism developing. And, uh, uh, the rebellion on Kosovo in 1981 often is seen as some kind of beginning of the end, 
uh, of Yugoslavia was clearly actually and openly a social revolt. Uh, and further development, it should be only natural that demands for greater social justice and equality would later come hand in hand with the demands for national equality, especially for a nation that increasingly felt itself somehow left behind. Uh, but also, on the other hand, there was a uh, dissatisfaction in the more developed republics. Uh, this was because, despite its market uh, orientation, Yugoslavia had always had its own structural funds, so to say. Uh, so, as you can imagine, of course, the, the, the protests from more developed republics, especially Slovenia and Croatia, were uh, about um, less developed areas exploiting them. This was actually the term uh, used. Uh, so, as Croatian nationalist uh, economists argued, uh, it is unjust for a more developed Croatia to give money to, to a Serbian problem, that is Kosovo, for instance. They, of course, tended to ignore the fact that uh, Croatia did, in fact, profit from its export of good and, and uh, capital to, to Kosovo, for instance. So, it would seem that the scene was set, economic inequality between republics and competitions by the ruling elites but uh, the situation was about to get much worse in the crisis developing in the 80s. Um, it, it would seem that the Yugoslav elites have always seemed to offer the, 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 the same solution to every economic problem, and that was essentially more market. Uh, in the 80s, these reforms also included experimenting with what was on the agenda on the more broader world scale, uh, and these are measures now recognized as neoliberal to a point. So growing debt to IMF demanded so-called macroeconomic stabilization, freezing of wages, firing excess workforce, and of course, finally, privatization. So rising unemployment created a potential social bomb that actually, in fact, did explode in an unprecedented series of strikes and workers' protests. Uh, also, most of these protests were, that were somehow later recognized as a beginning of a nationalist mobilization were at the time, if you, if you uh, analyze them, you even have video footage very clearly of, of what was going on there, that uh, these later recognized as, as national mobilization were in fact then understood as a legitimate workers' protest and they were articulated as, su as such. So my point is, uh, my point would be that while the a conflict between uh, uh, ruling elites was becoming more and more nationalist, so to say, even to a point where one of the constituent republics, and that is Serbia, imposed sanctions on a different uh, uh, constituent republic, and that is Slovenia. So, as opposed to this uh, um, ruling elite conflict that was becoming increasingly more nationalist, actually the, the huge mobilization from below that were uh, ex really existing were mostly uh, explicitly socially motivated. Um, well, the problem, of course, was that uh, socialism as a goal, as a project, was increasingly lo losing legitimacy on uh, on a global scale, which actually left some uh, left an open door, or left some space for allegedly new projects to emerge as an alternative to socialism. Uh, the alternative that, for instance, Croatian and Slovenian uh, leaderships presented was a more even totally independent nation state, that one that would be free from the so-called shackles of, of federation, and as such it was assumed it would be a successful competitor on an international scale. Of course, there was never any real alternative, so to say, the, the nationalists as well as uh, somehow pro-Yugoslav uh, politicians such as, for instance, Sante Marković, all were to, to some extent, uh, how to say, enchanted by, by this uh, neoliberal rhetorics and neoliberal dogma. Uh, however, it would seem that the, this idea of a new nation state, uh, free of its uh, obligations, so-called obligations toward other more backward uh, nation, could, could actually did have uh, some kind of an appeal to the more and more impoverished, uh, uh, impoverished population. But uh, it should also be recognized that the national, nationalist parties, especially, for instance, in Croatia, had a more, uh, much more immediate appeal to the population. Well, they actually did provide uh, influential positions and material uh, security uh, on, as, on some kind of local scale for their immediate supporters. Um, they finally did, uh, so to say, promise to create a new elite, and in this sense, they 
did regenerate this uh, ruling uh, elites to, to some point by uh, with uh, uh, with uh, mobil not mobilizing but with giving position to their own supporters. And you know, in Croatia, basically, in the wartime, the, the power of the ruling elites, this this influence of the, the to, to be part of the ruling elite was so so strong that even opposing uh, nationalist uh, politicians were actually assassinated in still unsolved cases. Um, well, at the same time, on the other side of the border in Serbia, uh, the motives to play the nationality card were actually equally unromantic. Uh, and for instance, despite all this medieval folklore of, of uh, around the issue of Kosovo, etc., Milosevic actually did not take control of Kosovo in the late 80s because of Emperor Lazarus and uh, his struggle with the Turks in the 14th century. Well, he didn't. He did this because he basically needed leverage in the struggle with the Slovenian leadership. Or more concretely, he needed Kosovo's vote in the highest bodies of the, of the federation. So, and as well as, as, as this situation, the Serbian rebellions in, in Croatia and later Bosto, Bosnia, which were to a point induced by the, the leadership of Serbia, uh, developed as an ethnic conflict, not because different communities did not know how to live with each other. In fact, they did live with each other for most of their uh, history. The reason was uh, the, the, the disposition of the Serbs in, in Croatia or Bosnia was the only way in, through which uh, the, the Serbian leadership could extort some kind of influence in, in those republics, increasingly becoming more independent. Of course, uh, we should not ignore the, the, the uh, influence of so-called foreign factor. Uh, just to give a small il illustration, um, for instance, Austrian banks, now uh, quite a major factor in the economies of the Balkans, got a jump start through some unusually beneficial business deals with the Croatian government. And at the same time, Austria was known as one of the first and most vocal supporters of Croatian independence. Um, the, well, basically, the trajectory of this long and winding roads of the tradition, the transition um, can't be presented here in full. However, I will try to illustrate some uh, well, major tendencies. Uh, so for instance, Slovenia seems to have, uh, up to recently, managed to position itself as a regional success story, maintaining its industry, large uh, state ownership, and export of goods and capital, primarily to countries of the former federation. Uh, Croatia seems to have had a, a different or more orthodox trajectory, hoping to create uh, some kind of economic miracle by uh, imposing Washington consensus uh, recipes. Or better, better to say, there was clearly an ideal of such a model, which was, uh, for instance, President Opelny expressed adoration towards Thatcher or even Pinochet. But uh, however, clientelist pro promises, especially in the wartime, forced the state for its own stability to somehow keep a, a, a large public spending. And this was again, for instance, repeated in the aid of the 90s when huge unemployment was hidden by <clears throat> sending a large number of people to early retirement, which actually was a, quite a problematic solution in the long run. Uh, special uh, wartime circumstances that existed in Croatia were even maybe more, more visible in Serbia. Privatization was uh, there even interrupted. Uh, as um, imposed sanctions forced the ruling elites to, well, to improvise, basically. Unfortunately, uh, uh, this did not uh, create uh, so-called last socialist country of Europe as part of the left has unfortunately romanticized Milosevic, nor has it actually created a strong and independent nation state as Serbian nationalists hoped. And basically, in the end, regardless of if they hoped to create a strong nation state, regional power, a legitimate international competitor, etc., through Washington consensus measures or through some kind of pseudo protectionist measures, all the countries of former Yugoslavia ended up, so to say, in the same basket, and that is safely on the European uh, periphery. And finally, concentration of capital through various privatization, as, as well as bluntly, well, illegal if you, if you will, uh, agreements uh, with the state uh, uh, led, uh, led basically to taking over of the, most of the economy by, by foreign capital. This is uh, the parts of the economy that could provide fast profits, uh, while the parts that needed investment were mostly, mostly closed. 
Uh, finally, um, in Croatia and Serbia, the nationalist regimes collapsed in face of complete failure of, of this kind of project of creating strong national state. Uh, the opposition from the 90s that took over now somehow rebranded itself as an anti-nationalist and so-called pro-European new and modern elite. Uh, as 10 years earlier, during the, the breakup of Yugoslavia, this change had also had some kind of mass support. Uh, but also, again, it did not present any new model of development. Uh, quite the contrary, actually. The solution was once again more privatization, deregulation, etc. But now, uh, not anymore with the, in the name of, of creating a nation, but in the name of becoming part of the European family, so-called European family. So th this would mean this was ex uh, um, explicitly an anti-nationalist model. Uh, the, the new liberal ruling elites actually based a lot of their political leg legitimacy on this opposition to, to the supposedly isolationist, warmongering nationalist policies, etc. However, their supposed uh, nationalist um, adversary appears to be somewhat of a, of a straw man. There doesn't uh, appear to exist any part of the ruling class that would now support the project of building a strong nation state and some part of some kind of uh, national capitalist, cap capitalism, etc. Uh, however, unfortunately, contrary to, to liberal mythology, not, not only did the European way, so-called European way, fail to provide development and breaking the, the circle of, of uh, growing poverty, but it also failed to eliminate ethnic tensions in the Balkans. The neoliberal uh, model, uh, well, this, this is basically some illustrations why. The, the neoliberal model force, forces neighboring countries to engage in some sort of a race to the bottom in a competition to attract foreign investment. But even more importantly, it has created basically failed states in which lack of functioning institutions force politicians to rely on national identity for legitimacy. This is a process very um, easy to, to, to see in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, for instance. Also, uh, this model has developed uh, ruling so-called comprador bourgeoisie which is characterized by the interest in communication only with the metropole, by completely, un, uh, while it is at the same time completely uninterested in the communication inside the region. Well, in, in short, this, this model has not solved the, the, the national issue. Um, it's, it's, it depends like this, it is somehow uh, obvious that the conclusions would uh, point us to, to, to in the direction that neoliberalism strengthens na na nationalism, etc. Uh, however, I would like to push this a bit further and say that although also this is true, uh, even more importantly, uh, in the periphery countries like those of the former Yugoslavia, it would seem that uh, there is still a clear and open national question which is not only strengthened by neoliberalism but which basically cannot be solved in, in capitalism. Um, so if, as I have tried to show, there is no possibility for a ruling classes to offer a different development model, uh, then it seems obvious that such a model can only be proposed by a working class, which, unlike the ruling class, is aware of that the system has failed it and it is interested in searching for, for alternatives. Uh, well, this is very obviously the role of the left movement. That is some kind of new left, which still unfortunately does not exist as a relevant political factor in the region. Uh, in the process of building such left in the region, it seems that it would be essential to handle the, the national question properly. Unfortunately, uh, so far most of the discussions on the left concerning nationalism have often confined themselves to lamentation about the supposedly paralyzing effect of the nationalism for some kind of revolutionary politics. Well, you know the, the, the role of the revolutionary movement is not actually to speculate about some kind of perfect con conditions in which the ready-made slogans can be then implemented. But it is rather the, the role of the revolutionary movement is to exploit the existing contradictions and act, uh, uh, act inside them, uh, and uh, to act inside the contradictions that the system itself is not capable of solving. And through that to present an alternative. So in former Yugoslavia, the Balkans, and even periphery in general, uh, it is exactly the national question that has proved such a contradiction, unsolvable for, for, the, for the system. And uh, it would seem that our ability to tackle the issue will in great part de determine the, the, the future of, of 
of the new left here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicola, for this um, uh, presentation, which was uh, rich in uh, many uh, uh, hypotheses and uh, interesting conclusions. I'm sure that there will be a discussion about that. Um, but um, uh, now we go ahead um, uh, with Fritz uh, first. He will um, speak mainly about uh, Germany in the context um, of uh, historical development of nationalism and racism in Germany and in the, in the current situation. Just because I brought yes, you some uh, funny pictures uh, in order that you don't have to watch me reading out my uh, script. Uh, but um, as I really start with something heavy, I maybe start with the pictures a, a bit later. Because as uh, Boris uh, already said, I'm just coming in from the start of a trial against the Nazi, uh, Nazi murderers in Germany who called themselves NSU, which means something like National Socialist Underground, uh, closely linked to the uh, na National Socialist, historical National Socialist period in Germany. And uh, uh, between the year 2000 and 2007, this group consisting of a nucleus of three Nazis, uh, supported by around 100 helpers and friends, murdered nine persons with migrant background and a police officer. Uh, they committed nail bomb attacks on migrant quarters with dozens of heavily injured and around 15 bank robberies um, for their self-supply. Uh, the motives were um, obviously deeply racist and uh, neo-nazistic and in so far um, it will be uh, interesting to follow the trial against uh, this group. Since Monday I witnessed the first session of the trial against the only woman in the terror squad called uh, Beate Chepe. Her two accomplices are said to have committed suicide during a showdown with the police. And this mysterious end of the NSU in November 2011 opens the view on the greatest secret service scandal in the history of Germany, which, and beyond that, sheds light on a nationalist tradition in post-war Germany until today. And this is the topic I want to talk uh, upon. Okay, this is uh, just some examples from uh, the greatest uh, a yellow press in Germany, the Bildzeitung, um, uh, agitating against uh, the Greek, um, uh, Greece and the Greeks. And I show you some, some more of them uh, just for the fun of it, in quotation marks. Um, this um, Involvement and entanglement, uh, the current entanglement of the German Inland Secret Service called Verfassungsschutz. Um, I don't know if you uh, understand. Verfassungsschutz means something like uh, protectors of the Constitution. Uh, the entanglement of the Verfass Verfassungsschutz by infiltrating NSU, this terror squad, with informants, supplying them with money and sheltering them from police action makes clear that the Inland Secret Service not only turns a blind eye to right-wing ac activities and even terrorism, but in some forms, and this is an interesting point, actively empowers these people. And this is not new. And now we, we go back into uh, history, way back into the post-war years uh, of um, the at least Western German resurrection, in quotation marks again, the official story tells us that the shock of the lost war, the total demolition even of their own country, the atrocities of the Nazis who were in the aftermath willfully ex excorporated from the German people, turned the country immediately into a democratic polity into which even fellow runners of the Nazis fitted in perfectly. Two really reactionary authors from the roles of the German Inland Secret Service, as far as I know, they are also on the payroll um, uh, of the Verfassungsschutz, 
write in a recent publication, I quote, Indeed, there were formerly deep brown National Socialists in high ranks, characters who had been religious followers of Hitler, but mostly not involved directly into crimes. But they had in the Federal Republic of Germany, FRG, to prove that they were Democrats. And for that, they tried to be even 100% Democrats because of their deeply brown past. Quotation end. And this is simply not true. But it took more than 60 years to question these founding myths of the Federal Republic of Germany Western part. It is a story of denial, belittlement, silent or even open complicity with the defeated Nazis and the story of a national narcissistic illness. From the very beginning, after the breakdown of the Third Reich, the Germans and even their unsuspicious leaders, like uh, the first federal ca chancellor, Konrad Adenauer, who was imprisoned himself during Nazi times, shifted away the immense guilt the great majority of the Germans had burdened and silenced a public debate, uh, debate on how that catastrophe, and especially the Holocaust, could have happened. From the very beginning, the Germans made themselves, saw themselves, and felt themselves as victims, too. And even if they admitted the war crimes and atrocities of the extermination policies, very often they pointed at their own losses and the bombed cities and charged it against the crimes against humanity they committed. Like, yet we have suffered ourselves enough uh, this was, yeah, we suffered uh, enough because our cities are destroyed too and many of our soldiers died and uh, people have been uh, um, uh, chosen away from their homelands and things like that. This was the birth of a set of myths together with the rapid e economical recovery of the Western uh, occupation zones due to the gigantic cash infusion of the Marshall Plan. The Holy Bible of the Young New State was the Grundgesetz, uh, the constitution that was elaborated during the Chiemsee sessions of the Constitutional Assembly. The tenor of it all was that there were lessons learned from the failure of the Weimar Republic. But what never was discussed was that the constitution was imposed on a defeated and deeply rotten people in which the Nazi sentiment prevailed behind the facade of denazification, re-education, and democratization. To confront the also lower rank responsibles from uh, Nazi times was held to be inappropriate, and the clearly clearing process of the denazification faded away soon during the reincorporation of the Western zones into the US-dominated Western bloc of the free world. The beginning of the Cold War against the former allies from the East was grounded by a deeply rooted anti-communism, which especially by Germans could be understood as an unbroken con continuity of the murderous anti-Bolshevism of the Nazis. My highly estimated colleague Erich Speter put it in a nutshell by pointing out that despite the enormous devastation of Germany, the guilty majority of Nazi fellow runners could win the impression that they had won the war nevertheless. Communists were under persecution, the Jews were gone, the former Nazis were welcome on the side of the Western Allies, remilitarization was in sight not 10 years after the lost war of annihilation, and the dollar-fueled new prosperity made it easy to forget the defeat and the guilt. Just a, a, a funny story um, um, uh, besides, uh, it, it went so far to silence the, the Nazi time uh, in the discussion that even the Hollywood uh, classics like Casablanca were cens censorated. That means in the uh, um, German version of Casablanca there were no Nazis. 
Just imagine. Major, no Major Strasser. And, and the story is not the story about uh, a refugee uh, running away from Nazi uh, Europe, but um, from a scientist in, in, in atomic uh, nuclear uh, business or so. <laughs> a, a totally different story. Um, um, yes, the, de de the developing uh, country blossomed out under the new wonderful formul formula of the social market economy, the soziale Marktwirtschaft, a moderate form of what is called the Rheinisch capitalism with its social responsibility. I want to shortcut this point by citing the highly admired German pop philosopher Klaus Teweleit, who, stunned by the observation of the Germans' indifference concerning the Holocaust and Nazi war crimes, concluded, I quote, the detachment of the Nazi history from the sentiment of the people was the emotional core piece of the FRG entity. However, the country was stuffed with specialists of the Nazi administration and soon the early leaders recognized that they could hardly abstain from involving them into the miraculous new birth. In a very short period of time, even heavily guilty Nazis could continue in their professional fields, which often had been to do with, had to do with the fight against the Slavic subhumans in the East and the extermination of the European Jews. High-ranked members of the leading annihilation elite could be found on every level of the new democratic state. Even in the chancellor's own office, there was a secretary called Hans Globke, who, as a lawyer, was the commentator of the 1935 anti-Jewish racist uh, legislation on the brink of the mass elimination. In nearly every single minister, ministry and state office, even in schools, at universities, in hospitals and police stations, one could find the Nazis who continued their career as if nothing had happened. Public and aggressive campaigns to free imprisoned war criminals and crowded funerals for admired generals and war heroes and the implementation of the muse of the splendid and unstained shield of the Wehrmacht the, the German army, and the knightly behavior of the German soldiers dominated the narrative of the war. And at the point, at this point, I want to come back to the Inland Secret Service of Germany that was also founded 1950 as a counterintelligence against Eastern German activities. The early chiefs of the Verfassungsschutz were often former members of Heinrich Himmler's extermination elite of the SS, the Gestapo and the Reichssicherheitshauptamt, many of them in high ranks above SS Hauptsturmführer. An early chief of the news weekly Spiegel, that you have maybe know, Detlef Becker said, I quote, to counter the Eastern specialists, we need specialists. May they have learned their nightmarish skills from Gestapo chief Heinrich Müller, SD chief Reinhard Heydrich, or even the Saturn's grandma. The ideological background could be very helpful in the following years of uh, anti-communist chase in the 50s and 60s, during the times of occupational ban, the so-called Berufsverbote in the 70s, which were social democrat times, by the way. Ten thousands of, job, thousands of job beginners were under suspicion and were interviewed in humiliating manner and had to be aware to be banned from their professions as postman, uh, engine driver, or even teachers. And the sa at the same time, the long-term president of the German Inland Secret Service, Hubert Schrübers, had to step back because evidence was found that he, as judge during Nazi times, delivered heavy sentence in political trials. And this was uh, mid-70s, years, uh, um, uh, 30 years later. Um, I could give you some, some more figures on uh, communists who have been persecuted and sentenced in comparison, for example, with uh, uh, Nazi uh, uh, perpetrators, who, um, uh, but uh, I think this would lead too, uh, too far away. 
it would be for sure unfair, now I come to a conclusion, to suppose that this very Nazi-like beginnings of the service, of the Inland Secret Service, still prevail. But anyway, there was founded a tradition that lurks through the entanglement of the Verfassungsschutz into the current neo-Nazi terror and the official politics of huggermuggering the involvement of state service in murder and bombing currently. No, not to talk about, uh, this, this could be another topic for, for a whole panel, the, uh, maybe you know the, the story about the Gladio um, organization all over Europe, this could be just another topic, the involvement of uh, Western uh, government into counter um, activities together with uh, Nazi activists all over Europe. Interesting uh, chapter, not yet really uh, uh, worked upon too much. On the other hand, there's also an economical founding. This is the other, uh, the other point I want to uh, um, uh, work out. Uh, an economical founding myth of the FRG, which until today affects Germany's polit politics and its self-esteem. The loss of the national pride after the surrender of Nazi Germany found its compensation in a new economical patriotism under the motto of German Wertarbeit um, made in Germany uh, in the economical simply uh, and uh, to be as Germany was, Western Germany was simply the most powerful nation of workers, entrepreneurs, traders and producers after the war. And this system was for sure capitalist and grounded on the virtues of Protestant ethics like punctuality, diligence, and reliability. Very German virtues, as you know. And in the competition with the second German state, the GDR, in the East, this German capitalism had to be buffered by social welfare and a balanced system of trade disputes with the unions as social partners. The result was positive. The German, the German economy recovered rapidly and beginning with the 50s, the years were prosperous and fat. This was the Wirtschaftswunder. You mentioned the word before in your uh, input too. It took decades to get Germany to question the national myth of the founding years, not earlier than 1979 the Germans were for the first time confronted with the systematical and work-sharing process of isolation, concentration, deportation and extermination of the German and European Jews. And it happened, just imagine, through a Hollywood TV production called Holocaust. Only these days, currently, Scientists came to the conclusion that there were enormously higher numbers of concentration camps, prisons and labor camps in Nazi-occupied Europe. The official number was until now 7,000. Thousands. U.S. scientists published a list of 42,500 camps and prisons recently. So, much, much more. Only in 2010, and this is an interesting point, there was a grand exhibition uh, upon slave labor during Nazi times in Germany, speaking about 20 million people who were displaced, kidnapped, deported, and, or imprisoned, and forced to, to work in different status uh, for the German perpetrator and occupiers. It took, again, just imagine, si uh, um, 65 years to come to these findings. During a period of renationalization after the fall of the Berlin Wall, it turned out to be official German policy to admit and confess the German guilt, but then to turn the own guilt into competence for nearly every trouble in the world. So to say, because we were perpetrators once, we now can judge terror anywhere because it is our historical duty to avoid developments that lead to new Auschwitzes, we can drop bombs on Belgrade again only 50 years after Hitler did. This new hypocrisy of the German nationalism goes well together with its uh, economical uh, supremacy in Europe and in the German-dominated EU. Some cynics call it 
location advantage Auschwitz. Because we did, uh, because we did it, we are now warranters of prohibition. The merry times of self-victimization -victim began, and this exculpative turn was fueled by emphasizing the sufferings of the Germans during the war, especially the bombings, detention as prisoners of war, and other adversity, adversities um, um, experienced by expellees from the former German eastern territories like Ostpreußen, uh, in Russia, uh, Schlesien in Poland, and Sudetenland in the Czech Republic. At the same time, atrocious pogroms took place in the beginning of the 90s, shortly after the reunification, and political indifference and in instrumentalization. This was a time when the NSU members were conditioned. They could be indeed convinced that they were executing the people's will because nobody stopped them at all. Just to give you some figures, um, only um, in the time between uh, 89 and uh, 92, during, uh, uh, immediately after the reunification, um, Nazis murdered uh, 17 people, 453 were heavily injured, and uh, 1,000, only three years, just imagine, uh, 1,900 um, uh, um, attacks against uh, non-Germans were registered. And one must remember, again, just a remark uh, that this time uh, the German asylum uh, paragraph in the Constitution was um, abolished, or more or less abolished, and again with the help of the Social Democrats in Germany. Um, both tradition lines, uh, the denial on the one hand, and uh, the economical uh, patriotism, this new form, have the Nazi past in common. The state doctrine manifest in the work of the secret service says more or less openly the enemy lurks on the left. The communists are still the greatest danger and not the Nazis that admittedly killed about 180 people after the reunification until today, but never were a danger for the state. And the above mentioned immense slave economy of the Nazis molded the picture of valuation of people as beneficial or harmful to the German economy. Migrant and foreign workers from the European South that were actively recruited for labor in prospering Western Germany in the 50s and uh, 60s were judged as fit to do the low performance work and non-responsible jobs the Germans were not longer ready to do. It is wonderful that many of these Gastarbeiters, guest workers, uh, who came from Yugoslavia, Greece, Spain, Portugal, Turkey, you know that, Italy also, um, many of these uh, Gastarbeiters, who were mostly confronted with heavy racist harassment and hostility, did not went away after that term, but stayed and brought an idea of multiculturalism to a country that still insists on the folkish racial blood heritage, jus sanguinis. The neoliberal development now makes workers all over the world the new slave laborers, not only for Germany, but for the whole first world, in quotation marks. But Germany, as taskmaster of Europe, managed to get rid of the direct troublesome handling of migrant control in burdening uh, the duty of refugee deterrence to the southernmost member states and to European agency, agencies like Frontex. The Amsterdam-based NGO United lists uh, 16,250 deaths since 1993 as fatal realities of the fortress Europe. And these are only the documented uh, cases. But also inside uh, the country, these borders are established between the very rich, the aggressive middle class in, fear, class in fear of economical decline, and the poor and precarized lower classes, but also, for example, young creatives whose income is not sufficient to make ends meet. The great labor market project of the Social Democrat Chancellor Schröder 
uh, and the toughened social welfare policies caused a landslide of the low wages section and questioned the fair standards that have been fought for the last five decades. The economical chauvinism of the Germans is a new form of nationalism that is rooted in the post-war post times of uh, frustration after the defeat. The first Wirtschaftswunder of the 50s is mirrored in the current boom of Germany. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Fritz, for this um, account on the current situation in Germany. And now we have, of course, uh, really very different um, uh, topics on the table. So, um, it will be um, uh, uh, maybe useful to structure the discussion in a certain way. Uh, the case of Yugoslavia, the case of Germany, the um, presentation of Maya, uh, uh, tackling the uh, uh, problems of um, economic competition in, in Europe and its relation to history in the both cases. Um, I would uh, just like uh, now to open the, the floor um, and to give you opportunity to, um, to, uh, to ask things or to, uh, to comment uh, the presentation. Uh, we will have a look what is the main interest and then uh, develop a hopefully dynamic discussion. So, who will be the first? <laughs> Katharine? I have two, two questions, uh, in fact. Uh, the first to, to, to Maya on the, the recent events in Slovenia to inform us about the debates which exist. Uh, uh, what were the, the, the reaction after there were the strong uh, ups, popular upsurge or so mobilization, but also there is, there, there, there are uh, discussion, there were the workers Punk University, the main school and so on. What are the discussion among uh, uh, the left, red unionists uh, and so on about how to answer to the crisis today? What, what are in Slovenia? And the second kind of a question with a, a small comment is on, on Yugoslavia. Uh, so, uh, my, my question is about uh, what, is there a debate and what kind of debate today uh, in any part of the ex-Yugoslavia, I mean, and uh, among anyone, about the cause of the failure uh, of the system? Uh, there are two kind of explanation of the failure, which uh, I think uh, is very... Well, one which have been rejected, and I, I think we can reject very easily, is the interpretation as a, a fatal ethnic hatred, hatred people in, incapable to, to live together or things like that, so that nationalism of ethnicism being the cause of, of the, the failure. I, I don't think so. Uh, the second, but I mean, I want the, the, the debate. Linked with this kind of interpretation, we often read the idea that the, the Yugoslav uh, construction was an artificial, uh, if you if you believe, uh, because of uh, uh, the past uh, opposition and so on. So that's the first part. Second kind of uh, interpretation that we find is uh, saying that it is an external complot. Neoliberalism, it is the debate also of the forum today, uh, and, and, and that uh, neoliberal uh, powers uh, capitalism he, uh, didn't want uh, a Yugoslav alternative to exist and wanted to destroy it so that uh, all nationalism were puppets in the hands and so on. So that's a second kind of interpretation. I just leave a, a, a remark on that. I don't want to develop my own interpretation. I only want to give some remark. I, first, I don't believe there is an homogeneous, stable and clear-cut neoliberal policy and that there were a clear cut uh, international uh, neoliberal policy on Yugoslavia except the idea of uh, privatization and restoration but at what level? So I do believe that in a, a certain period for instance uh, the, the US were more in favor and even the International Monetary Fund up to 90 up to the separation of uh, Slovenia and Croatia was more in favor of Ante Markovic 
as uh, the last uh, first uh, minister at the Yugoslav level, to, to, to develop uh, 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 a liberalization and that is privatization in Yugoslavia, than to uh, have a split of the Yugoslav because they were fright uh, well, first they wanted the debt to be reimbursed and they preferred a strong federal state to do it. Uh, and second, they were afraid of uh, uncontrolled situation. Then, among the European powers themselves, was there a clear-cut policy? I think that Germany or the Vatican has not the same attitude uh, towards Yugoslavia than the French one, and then that there was an evolution, uh, even in, 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 in inside. So I want to know if you have uh, that uh, interpretation. Uh, and, uh, and, and the last uh, comment, uh, if, if it is neither an external complot, nor a fatality of impossibility to live together, then the main uh, uh, discussion for the left is that, uh, and this is the, the discussion I'm interested in, of course, is the socio-economical and political reason of the failure. Huh? Because then we have also the, the same debate for an alternative Europe to be built. For me, I think the Yugoslav issue uh, gives lessons for building an alternative. How do you organize different nations with different level of development? How do you organize democracy? How do you reduce uh, inequalities and so on? And so I, I, I think that is a, a key debate. Uh, thank you. I think it was uh, so many questions that uh, we should give them uh, opportunity to react immediately, Nicola and, and Maya. Well, regarding the upri recent uh, uprising in Slovenia, I think um, Around uprising, uh, several groups uh, were formed, but I think that it would be right to say that they were really spontaneous uprising, that people came not because on, on the initiative of various groups, but, be, but because they wanted to come. And part of the folklore was that each person made for himself or herself his own protest. So it was kind of contest uh, among the people participating in the uprising, who will find out the most funny, uh, the most nice uh, sl uh, slogan, uh, sl slogans. Then a few ten thousands of people uh, to gathered together uh, in the December, and in the last there were fewer than in the beginning, so the power uh, is uh, losing its, uh, so the, the, the uprisings are losing its strength, but the first target was to uh, make uh, dismissal of Janez Janša and his government, uh, and his government, and the uprising uh, reached this goal. And the second was uh, that in this protest, which we seen, uh, which people brought to the to the uprising, there were, um, of course, majority against Yansha, but uh, many of them un were anti-capitalist. So uh, you see that uh, not, they blamed on, on, not only right-wing-oriented uh, party for the, the economic troubles, but also the disillusion about the capitalism, uh, ca capitalist system is also very present among the, uh, among the people. And it is interesting, uh, there were many, uh, many uh, tri tries, uh, tr tries uh, to um, take over of the um, uh, protest, protest by uh, official party or even, or even to pro pro provoke negative reaction. For instance, there was a group of neo-Nazi at the first uprising, which provoked um, sc scandal and terrified, um, uh, uh, throw molotovs uh, and provoke terror among the people. And it was, uh, it's not cl very clear, but uh, there are strong um, indicates that they were hired by Janša's uh, party to, to 
put a bad light on the on the on the protests. And the last point was that uh, among the the slogans, there were also some slogans against trade unions. So the protesters also consider trade unions as one of the government uh, state uh, st uh, state institutions which should be also fight against it. I don't know if this protests, uh, 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 slogans were imposed by the government or the <laughs> partisans, it's n never clear, but uh, it's not uh, rare that uh, si trade unions appear as one of the state institutions and not acting uh, according to the interest of the old people. Um. Yeah. So first to answer the question of whether there are discussions on the left concerning the, the this, uh, this moment, uh, falling apart of, of Yugoslavia. Well, we can say that there are some discussions, very few and uh, well, maybe not well articulated. There is maybe no serious project to like historically from left perspective analyze it in a systemic way, but um, <coughs> There are some movements in, in this direction. For instance, we are all uh, um, anticipating with impatiently Koritsa's uh, book, uh, the comrade that was here on the, the last panel, uh, which uh, was supposed to come out very soon and which will answer some of these questions, which is product of uh, several years of work, etc. But um, even though we, uh, I, I would, it would seem to me that we don't have a complete uh, picture of, uh, or that was that is a product of a serious uh, uh, work of several years. What is somehow a common stance? It would seem to me, at least, is that this uh, complete um, dismissal of of uh, this type of interpretations, which come very irritatingly come very often from the from the left in western europe uh, which you which you stated or either romanticizing about the mentality or on the other hand uh, seeing some kind of international complot which is intelligently engineered and used people like uh, pawns on a, on a checkboard which are well well, for, for at least uh, there is this, uh, it is clear to, to, to be active here, to, to live here, it's, it's clear that this kind of interpretation are not valid. And uh, all the um, comments you made about uh, uh, the, there existing no common foreign policy uh, concerning the Yugoslavia by foreign uh, states, etc. And of course, very, very different uh, development inside uh, ex-Yugoslavia, between Slovenia, Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia, etc. These are all very correct. Unfortunately, it's not easy to explain them all in 20 minutes uh, uh, discussion. But uh, what I did try to somehow present, it, I, would, I somehow or, uh, organized my presentation to be pole uh, polemical, which uh, what I did try to somehow suggest is that uh, um, Instead of this uh, type of understanding as nationalism as a, uh, somehow uh, this uh, idea that took over the people, well, the, the basic fact that nationalism is in fact uh, uh, product of the of the state, that is product of a of a political power, nationalism. Nations don't create states; the states create uh, create uh, nations. So in the in a sense, it seems to me that uh, this type of development, which went towards uh, inter-ethnic conflict inside Yugoslavia, was somehow not, of course, not orchestrated by uh, um, by intelligent uh, elites, but definitely, in a way, pro pro project by the republican republic elites in their attempts, in their power struggle, basically. You know. This is still uh, something to be quite expanded and, and analyzed, analyzed much, much better. Of course, and the, the foreign factor, although there, the, there is no such thing as a foreign uh, complot which orchestrated the whole thing, it's never to be underestimated, but uh, uh, it's, it's, kind of, it's not a simple solution in which you can say that this is the, the, the main factor. Okay, the next uh, question.
Outside the uh, left-wing circles, of course, the, the awareness of the, the direct close uh, implications of the Verfassungsschutz with the NSU. That is, is it is this still the, the main narrative uh, in the media or in the general public about them, the Verfassungsschutz being blind or one eye, or is there a growing conscience about uh, the, the direct implication and NSU as, uh, as in, a, in a way, a product of, of Verfassungsschutz? Well, it's an interesting question because um, uh, it's definitely um, uh, more and more people see that there is an involvement and this is because we have four parliamentary um, um, commissions uh, who are um, uh, collecting evidence about this thing and the evidence is really harsh. That means uh, the, the system of informants in the Nazi scene is, is blown up right now and people uh, see how many um, informants are entangled in the whole thing of, uh, of Nazi activities and Nazi terrorism. And so far, my hope is that in the moment we, the, the window is open to really question the existence of the Inland Secret Service, which is uh, very, very uh, much which we could maybe achieve, but on the long run, I doubt it. But there is an awareness, and people don't want to be silenced away if they criticize uh, the Inland Secret Service anymore. So, uh, and so. Yes, we had a perfectly similar event in Hungary, you may know, or these Roma killings and uh, people from the military intelligence were involved. The official government theory is that liberals in the secret services have condoned racist killings in order to compromise the pure Hungarian nation. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's, that would be an idea. <laughs> this is the way it works, yes. <laughs> But I, I, maybe uh, you allow me just one remark on the, on the question before, because um, in continuation of the, the, uh, my thoughts on, upon the German nationalism uh, after the reunification, 
the uh, Yugoslavian uh, civil war was discussed quite different. Um, uh, Boris, maybe you remember that uh, we um, had the impression that uh, the German policies in Yugoslavia were the original sin in an aggressive uh, foreign policy. The Germans were the first who recognized the Yugoslavian part uh, republics and uh, they were fueling the conflict with uh, weapons, uh, as you know, I, I'm sure. Uh, but we definitely saw a, a st not really a complot, I don't see that like that, but there, there was a, a high interest of this new coming German um, uh, uh, hegemoni hegemonial uh, um, power in Europe uh, concerning uh, the uh, Yugoslavian situation. More questions? Yeah. Thank you. My name is Luciano Lukšić. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Burschel, I think. Okay, uh, regarding what you mentioned, uh, the Gladio uh, conspiracy, I'd say, uh, is it sure that it has finished, it has ended? We don't know, of course, we agree. Uh, so let's, let's come to the, this term neoliberalism, which is uh, in some way different from classical liberalism, which was based on the freedom of individuals. And neoliberalism is uh, concerned with the freedom of companies, concerns. So we don't have the individuum as the basis of democracy, but behind them we have this kind of system, conspiracy, which uh, deals with media and manipulate the uh, public opinion in order to uh, gain uh, advantage on a democratic election. So, is it possible that the European Parliament change this uh, situation in a way that start uh, controlling the, the, the banking system, the financial system, uh, because behind all this is a circulation of money which can be traced and controlled. So, do you have any suggestion how the uh, European Parliament can do it, if anything? Because in Italy, for example, Mario Monti uh, makes some very important changes in the banking system in order to control all the uh, circulation of money above 500 euros. So, you cannot buy anything uh, above 500 euros by paying in a uh, banking note, but you must use your uh, uh, current account. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, my hope uh, is that in, in the long run the, the, the European Parliament will get more democratical legitimation and more power to control things. As far as we are now, the control lies uh, um, uh, by the, the uh, national governments and the most powerful of them and not by the um, parliament. And so far, um, I would say yes, there is a hope, but I doubt that we will really see um, success uh, in, the, in the next years because the situation is totally different. This is not a parliamentary uh, feder federal state of Europe, but it's uh, a state of those who have the economical power, as you uh, pointed out. And in so far, the only way to, to, to make it a project of the people, the project of um, social movements and so on, it has to be more democratical, more, um, well, uh, based on the, on the people living in this, uh, co on this continent, I would say. Well, this is a, bi a, a, a little bit um, Blah, blah, I know because I don't really see this development. Sorry for that. Yeah, it's sure, 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 sure it is. Nicola wants to comment. Yeah, just a brief comment about the, the legitimacy or, or potential for a 
democratic European Parliament. Well, I think that the problem is much more broader. It's not just the issue of universal vote and then we have the real representative of the, of the people. Um, there is a big issue of uh, a large part of working class in uh, a lot of uh, countries of the core, for instance, France and Germany, which have a large, large part of, well, almost uh, occasionally almost up to 10% of the population which are working on the most difficult jobs without citizenship rights and without the, the right to vote. So th there is this uh, kind of uh, um, discrimination of a huge part of the working class, uh, class uh, which does not have the political rights, has the right to for temporary work or is illegal. So th just to, to apply this kind of uh, vote is and uh, is, is not basically uh, will not give the, the democratic legitimacy to, to the state and uh, what is what is even more important this uh, type of mi migration from the uh, periphery to the core has deepened in this crisis and there hasn't been much change in actually the, the the situation of the economic migrants has worsened in the, in yes. the crisis yes so th this is a huge problem for, for the idea of, of legitimacy of the European Parliament. I don't see another question at the moment. The problem is probably that uh, there, were, uh, there were so diverse uh, presentations um, so probably on every uh, presentation we could uh, develop our own discussion. Um, yes? Well, since nobody posed the question, I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna try to, to pose some or uh, just give a brief remark. Um, it's concerning the, uh, the, the presentation that, you, that Fritz did, and it's concerning the part of the um, historical memory and dealing with the historical memory in, in, in Germany, right? And I would like to just stress out that here in Croatia during, I mean, back in like last 20, 25 years concerning this historical remark and dealing with the historical memory, uh, especially Second World War and, 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 and those things, um, lots of historians who, uh, when when the argument was, you know, uh, transcending the academic field and entering the political field, if we can divide it at all, but, uh, when, it, but when it was entering this political field, they told, and uh, historians and po politicians alike uh, told, um, they were constantly repeating it uh, in a sense that, yeah, I mean, we should pull, leave all these uh, things historical behind, we should leave history to history, and um, deal with the, deal with the things as the Germans did, <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a sense, you know, posing 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 the posing uh, posing like the Germany uh, Germany example of dealing with the historical memory as a you know something that that that's positive. Well, maybe from their stance, they knew what they they knew what were they talking about, and it was a positive since. Um, we were dealing and we are still dealing here in Croatia and ex-Yugoslavia as well with a revisionist onslaught in, in, in history. So this was, this was just my remark here. This is an interesting point because um, Germany is uh, really a, a best practice example for, uh, all over the, for everybody all over the world and I doubt that uh, this picture of Germany is really uh, right, because as I pointed out, um, the, even the memory uh, of uh, Nazi times is now instrumentalized f to, for their power policies. That means, uh, what, what I said before, because uh, the Germans managed to really handle their history um, uh, uh, in, in the best way one could think, they are allowed now to make uh, a responsible uh, world policy as they do. And they um, really try to, to intervene in so many conflicts and they really try to um, 
influence so many, especially economical um, uh, developments in the European Union, and they always have this uh, this um, background of says um, Musterknabe best practice uh, example and it's it's definitely not true just to give you one um, uh, current example in uh, October last year there was um, opened uh, a memorial for the murdered uh, Sinti and Roma people uh, during the Nazi times in Europe which were some 500,000 people who have been killed not only in Auschwitz but nearly everywhere all over Europe and they opened in the one day the 24th as far as I remember of October and the next day the uh, Roma people who came uh, to Germany from ex uh, for example the Balkans and, and Romania were expelled from Germany so at the same time the memorial is the one thing we can just wow we did it again uh, we, we, we had a fine memory, this was brilliant we, uh, what we did and the next day the same country is just expelling people who are using the freedom of uh, travel in Europe. Coming from Romania uh, and, and uh, other countries uh, who belong to the EU and expelled them. And so far there is this hypocrisy I really hate. Maybe just a short comment, and I find very interesting this phenomenon of, of um, post, uh, post ideology, where, where where you have a set of um, equivalences between, let's say, <coughs> uh, communism, uh, fascism, Nazism, uh, so much so that uh, uh, a new term has been coined, and uh, uh, like uh, uh, anti-fascist fascism. I don't know if you have it uh, in uh, in your experience. Uh, uh, this notion that uh, uh, freedom, uh, uh, freedom of speech should be uh, uh, um, um, generalized, uh, 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 so so as to include those who uh, uh, preach a um, sort of a political ideology of, uh, well, not only limiting freedom of speech but uh, several other stuff. So uh, I was wondering, uh, is the, is that at all present in? in Germany uh, or maybe someone else can also comment it because it's a uh, for instance we had a protest uh, last year and uh, uh, the, the, the mainstream uh, news uh, um, TV news uh, covered it uh, on the one side there were a handful of uh, ridiculous uh, right wing and and on the other side were uh, like us and, uh, but uh, without the flags, there was disagreement. We, we won't go with the anarchist flags, uh, the communist flags, red flag, none of that. So they actually, uh, what they did is in Photoshop, they, they added a flying red star to stick on the banner in order to... Uh, uh, in the newspaper? Yeah, no, in uh, TV. In TV. You know, it's a flying looking video in order to uh, uh, um, let the public know that, okay, from one side you have these uh, the fascists, right, right, but watch also for the left horde ready to, I don't know. Yes. I don't know what. I think this, this is a, a very, very important topic on European level because um, uh, we have this in Germany for sure. The, the, the trouble uh, is on the left side and uh, um, uh, the, the communism or socialism or whatever is the same as Nazism, which is um, a, a heritage from, from the uh, totalitarism theory, uh, not really coming from in this way from Hannah Arendt, but um, uh, how to say, uh, described by her. And uh, we have the same problem because of uh, as you know, uh, the eastern part of Germany, I did not speak about the eastern part of Germany, it could be very, very interesting to, to uh, compare the development of GDR and FRG, um, because it, it is quite similar. And um, the uh, result is that in, in the reunified uh, Germany, still you have this very, very deep-rooted anti-communism in the heads of the people, in the heads especially of um, uh, officials and, and officers of, of the state and so on. And so it is, it is a systemical 
mis mistake or, or, or failure of the uh, German uh, official policy to um, have the problem on the left side and to really repress, for example, Antifa groups and uh, left-wing youth groups and things like that. This is just current policies now, especially from side of the Verfassungsschutz again, the Inland Secret Service. And um, on the other hand, you have a scientific school that says um, um, it's, it's like a horseshoe. Uh, in the middle of the horseshoe, you have the same middle of the society, the, 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 the good people, the Democrats, uh, those who are protective uh, to the state and to the constitution and things like that. And as, uh, the, the farer you go out on the, on the two um, uh, arms of the horseshoe, uh, they come nearer, the, the right wing uh, enemies of the constitution and the left wingers, and in the end they nearly touch each other, it's the same. It's the ideology which is currently under the Merkel, uh, the second Merkel government. It is a state doctrine. And in so far, it's interesting, uh, because I just, if, if, I, if I may, I just want to give an example. I tried to, to make a, a big, uh, how to say, anti-fascist, anti-racist conference in Budapest uh, two years ago and tried to come together with friends from uh, Hungary, from uh, Russia, from Poland, uh, from Serbia and so on, people from uh, Eastern and Middle European uh, countries. And uh, we did not really manage to come together and to promote our um, uh, festival or our campaign, which was called Reclaim Solidarity, um, because of uh, the, well, the Eastern European anti-communism, which, which is quite different from the German anti-communism, but in the end it's the same, because uh, uh, left-wingers, socialists, and, and, uh, or people who call themselves communists in Eastern Europe, uh, uh, they are really lost. Because the moment they say, I'm a left-winger, I'm a radical left-wing or something, they are out of discussion. Uh, I think I, I don't have to tell you, because some of you may experienced, uh, have experienced that uh, on their own, uh, but this is really a problem. This uh, extremism theory that says, in fact, Nazis and communists or left-wingers are the same, and we are these days these uh, years confronted with this um, strange ideology. Um, um, I have a question for Nicola. It was uh, towards the end of his talk where he mentioned the uh, national question. And sort of you mentioned it, but you didn't really sort of elaborate. You said it's kind of this internal contradiction. Um, and so I was wondering, um, that's sort of first part of the question. And then uh, second part of the question where, um, you know, sort of we have these two talks, I mean, uh, Fritz's and Nicola's. And so in uh, Fritz's talk, nationalism seems to be such a powerful explanation for all these things, whereas you sort of reject nationalism as this, uh, as this you know, ideology that actually has, you know, power to um, persuade people and mobilize them. Uh, and uh, I was just wondering, and then you mentioned also the working class where, um, you know, and in certain cases, uh, it's just this weird phenomena where sort of working class interests get to be aligned with sort of the interests of the national, nationalist elites. So um, I guess, um, if you can briefly, how you know, um, sort of comment on either of these uh, two questions. Uh, thank you for this very good question. We have another one from Peter, um, and I would suggest that we we have this question, maybe another one, and then make a final uh, uh, statements uh, round. Uh, Basically, I would like to, to just to add a very brief comment, it's, it's not a question if you allow me, on what has been said before uh, on uh, the, this policy of uh, making uh, Nazi equal with, uh, with left. 
we have in the Romanian constitution enshrined an article which says that any communist or Nazi parties are forbidden by law. So this is enshrined in the constitution. But at the same time, to show that there is a, 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 a sort of a, a nationalistic or nationalist uh, phobia, in the same constitution we have enshrined in the first article that Romania is a national unitary state. And this is, this is something which, at least in my opinion, uh, uh, has been gone at least 100 years ago. So it, the role of the so-called national unitary states have fulfilled their historical role and it was somewhere in, in, at the turn of the centuries probably and then it, it faded away. And you, you still, there, probably there are other states where you have this enshrined in, 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 in the fundamental law of the country, which shows something. Thank you. Is, is there another question? If not, we, we start maybe with uh, Fritz for the last round. Now we have more fundamental questions, <laughs> which can combine also the different aspects. Uh, Slavoj Žižek said in an interview with the Neue Zürcher Zeitung uh, that the uh, right-wing populists and uh, right-wing parties in Europe um, have more sexy offers for the people. And I think this is quite true because uh, they are selling simple truth. They are selling simple recites for the crisis. They are offering national uh, identification, a uh, national myth. I think uh, I'm just thinking about the the, the crown of uh, uh, King Stephen in in uh, Hungary, which was with with a with a uh, emotional s ceremony uh, brought into the parliament and things like that. They offer something uh, people seem to need, and uh, on the other hand, the left side which I belong to, is too weak. We are not loud enough, we are not powerful enough, we don't offer interesting new ways, solutions, ideas, and or if we do, nobody cares. And uh, I think this is the, the, the problem we are confronted with. We have to be more sexy. <laughs> Thanks. Nothing to add. <laughs> I don't want to compete any, with anybody on this uh, uh, on this platform. <laughs> uh, I would like only to add to the question about the world view or the point of view of the wor workers. Uh, once there was a huge meeting of trade un mem members of trade unions, and uh, uh, one of representative called me a day after, and he was terrified what he heard. Uh, from the workers themselves, and uh, uh, nationalistic, uh, uh, very, uh, and the, actually they were repeating what they heard through, medi through medias. And he was terrified what, was, what is the base of the trade unions themselves and uh, concerned what to do about it. Uh, so uh, this is not really maybe a revolutionary force. Thank you. Uh, there are a lot of questions, so I, I'll try to answer quickly the ones I, I, I managed to, to write down, so we can maybe discuss this also later, you can ask me. So, I mean, it's a bit uh, difficult to expect for me to give the answer to the national question here, but uh, I will try to give a short general uh, drawing, so, and maybe to, to give a concrete example. Uh, well, I think it's quite clear that there is, if you look at the situation in Bosnia or uh, even Kosovo or even Serbia with Sanjak, etc., that there is such a thing as unresolved uh, national uh, issue. And of course, it very generally seems that it won't be, it, is, it isn't possible to, to answer it in, a, in this kind of forms of uh, small dependent uh, uh, countries which are oriented to, towards communication with the metropole 
only. So some kind of uh, uh, um, coordination, communication inside the region on an equal ground could maybe provide a better platform for for the uh, settling of inter-ethnic uh, relationship. Uh, and, uh, and of course the prerequisite for this thing is to be, uh, for, for, uh, to, to, to accept the, the rights of, of uh, uh, self-determination for every nation individually. So basically, it's to illustrate, it's impossible to imagine uh, uh, some kind of cooperation, let's say, of the left in the Balkans. If you have, for instance, Serbian left, which says that Kosovo is a part of Serbia, or if you, as, as we do, if you have Greek left, which uh, comes to international conferences and they says that Macedonia is not Macedonia, it's Greece, and this is just some kind of Slavic whatever. So uh, this kind of, yeah, uh, this kind of uh, problem is, uh, is the real issue. So, of course, the, the unity, for instance, on the Balkans is necessary, and it is only possible if we accept the, the rights of self-determination of individual. Th this is paradoxically the only way to, to, to build unity, it would seem to, to me. Uh, maybe also, uh, I would also like to say on this issue of, uh, uh, workers being nationalist. Well, of course, I, I think that uh, it's a uh, large, it has something, for instance, in the West, it had something to do with uh, uh, this right-wing populist specifically targeting the working class, etc. But I also think that, for instance, in Croatia, there was a huge issue um, in the 90s, which still lasts today, that you have uh, this progressive organization, let's say human rights NGOs, etc., et which are explicitly elitist, which are uh, uh, which do not uh, uh, how to say struggle to to gain a broad base, which do not agitate uh, uh, inside the population to uh, to how to say intervene into politics, but which have the structure of being financed from abroad and being again in communication with the foreign investors and so to in a way almost conflicting the the uh, almost in conflict with with the with the population here so this this type of uh, uh, attitude uh, that the, the the liberals generally regardless of be the parties ngos or individuals whatever seem to have uh, created much more dependence on the foreign uh, foreign financiers uh, than on the 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 uh, how to say support in the in the base in the masses. So this is some kind of a huge problem, which, by all means, the the left in the future must avoid <laughs> because it, it's it's really a, a completely lost situation if if we can't avoid this kind of attitude. Okay, thank you um, for all the contributions and also for the participation uh, for uh, your participation. We have now. Um, one hour uh, break and start again at half past three with a panel on the national question in uh, in Western Europe, mainly in Central Europe. Um, uh, so, okay, we will uh, have this uh, one hour uh, break and then uh, be back here um, at half past four. Thank you very much. <laughs>